everybody. Assistant Chief uh, Mark Schauer in the box. It's, uh, I don't know, been a couple of months. You've been uh, bogged down with work? Yes, sir. Lots of uh, special things going on. Like? Uh, special investigations and, uh, you know, the run-of-the-mill crimes and property crimes and all kinds of things going on. Well, I'm I'm uh, glad we finally got that whole uh, deal where they presented that uh, Pat Suter case to the grand jury, and she was indicted. Of course, uh, I've heard it said you can indict a ham sandwich, but I've never seen a ham sandwich come up with a flimsier excuse than I thought it was a garbage can, so I just hopped right on it. So, uh, you can still stop and pick up the trash. If you well, you could. Trash can. Yeah, but you know that's uh, what is. I leave that. I, I I leave picking up litter to somebody else. Uh, I'm too good to do that. What What is third degree? What is What is that punishable by? It's uh, not a lot. Okay, it's first is worse. I first think, than yeah, third. Yeah, first is very serious, but third degree you can go to prison. You can? Yeah, substantial fine, and you could serve years in prison for a third degree. It's a, third degree is very serious. Okay. You know, Mauricio Celis' name popped up again in the news. Really? He, yeah. <laughs> it was uh, oh, over the weekend when it said. This is the way the story uh, went. Uh, Mauricio Celis has decided to get himself some law credentials. So he enrolls in Northwestern Law School. Hmm? When they found out that he had some uh, criminal convictions, they booted him out, and he sued him Mm. because he claims, well, you didn't ask me if I had any criminal convictions. And the school maintained, you know, you should be more forthcoming with that. So they kicked him out right before graduation. So he said he'd spent $76,000. And he wanted that back. Now, there was some kind of uh, out-of-court settlement, but uh, I just thought it was uh, remarkable that uh, another name from the uh, past uh, showed up. Um, and here we are. What what did you say that precipitated me going into that ramble? Oh, I just didn't know what the, what the crime was, oh. what, you know, what, what it was punishable by. Well, and... He got 10 years probation. Is that what? Okay. I don't it's, it's very common in a first offense, at least, to get probation, unless it's a violent crime. So. That reminds me of that. When you're yeah. hauling off stacks of $100 bills in a dump truck, I I just really... you got to look at who's going to prison. Um, you look at the violent criminals that are going away. Um, mm-hmm. You compare that to the amount of space they have, and that's what, the, that's what happens. So... It used to be, if you do the crime, you're going to do the time. Now it's, if you pick the right crime, mm-hmm. you'll be on probation. Yeah, especially if it's a non, non-violent crime. A white-collar crime. Yeah. Like stealing zillions of dollars from uh, unsuspecting investors. Um, uh, but there, there was a, um, there was a, it, it was a, there was a problem, the, DA's office didn't think that the investigation was concluded. The uh, yeah. investigators thought, eh, we've given you everything. You want us to try the case as well. And, and we've seen hmm. that go on. It happens sometimes. But the grand jury, like you know, it's, it's in total control of the DA. Yeah. So. And now we'll see. And we'll never know because it's a secret proceeding, so they mm-hmm. can't talk about it. Well, but you're saying now we'll see because it's... Well, they're going to have a trial, mm-hmm. and it'd be interesting. It's not Dick DeGaron. It's, it's his brother. His brother. Yeah. yeah. They have a relationship with uh, some Corpus Christians. The DeGaron brother's aunt, I think that's right, lives in Corpus, and she's yeah. an environmentalist well, activist. Well, so. shoot, he won't have to, you know. But you do have to admit. He wanted to spend money at the uh, hotel and just yeah. stay with his aunt. Yeah, that's probably uh, that's what I hear. But you do have to admit, you throw Dick DeGaron's name around, that'll perk you up. Well, <laughs> yeah, but it's, it's kind of like uh, uh, Representative Gowdy was uh, talking about uh, yesterday. Uh, foliation of evidence, which means hiding something. Foliation. When, yeah, 
I like foliation. It. No, I'm going to use and, that today. And when you have been accused of a third degree something, and you drop Dick DeGaren's name, we're thinking, you know what? I, I'm having. I'm going all the way to the other side now. <laughs> I thought that whole thing was uh, kind of shaky and uh, questionable when I heard it. Mm-hmm. I thought it was a garbage can. Please. And then uh, talking about, you know, well, you know, we had this uh, vision thing and you're oh, driving without a license. Oh, mm-hmm. I, I see. All right. News Radio 1360. KKTX. So I saw uh, Cooksey on uh, TV over the weekend, all dressed up in his uh, greenies and making a bust yeah. been had this uh, house under observation for uh, quite a while they helped uh, atf out on a case but yeah no, we have a matrix we use for any yeah. of our search warrants and if the conditions meet the matrix then swat has to be called out so you know for entry for dynamic mm-hmm. entries it was pretty dynamic they looked like it ripped half the um uh one of the windows out it was uh but they found a lot of cocaine and yeah. uh, money and uh so there's stuff and nice house, nice neighborhood. Yeah. People have been complaining about the traffic. Yeah, and I think it was a serial offender, too, that had been arrested before. So it wasn't, oh, that's it wasn't the first time. Yeah. Uh, what are you uh, guys experiencing with uh, with this uh, uh, influx of uh, illegals? Uh, is it any different than it was? I mean, all we're hearing about is... Uh, uh, children's like the uh, Bogan Camp uh, place. It's I I see them around there all the time, and I guess they walk to the mall if they're uh, accompanied by an adult. Yeah, well, Bogan Camp serves different purposes, not just for that. You know, that's troubled youth. Mm-hmm. But um, there, there's two ways that it might affect us here locally. One is the pursuits, because we'll we'll sometimes get in pursuit or constables or out of, out the, more in the, more so in the county that might come into city limits. And you get these horrible wrecks, like the one that happened up between Beeville and uh, off of Beeville there a couple of years ago when they yeah. killed, uh, what, 15, 17 people in, the, in, a, in a vehicle. So we'll get those kind of turnovers where people uh, will just run off into the brush. But when we arrest somebody here locally, um, we'll just notify the Nueces County uh, Jail when we arrest them. And they're the ones responsible for working with Border Patrol. We don't actually arrest anybody for immigration violations. The other way it could affect us, too, is... Uh, we have a very good forensics unit here, and we kind of serve everybody in the, the neighborhood because we're the biggest guy in the block. Right. So uh, we'll help the medical examiner identify um, people that they can't find identification on. And that means having to do some um, very intrinsic forensics on some of these bodies that come across. So those are two ways that we sometimes are impacted by it here locally. What's the guy's name? Forensics guy? Joe? John. Our guy's John Hornsby. Yeah, Hornsby. Hmm? That's it. Yes. <laughs> you could have John asked, Hornsby. You know. <laughs> All right. And uh, what was the... Uh, oh. I saw that uh, one of the... Uh, no, it was the Border uh, Patrol guys arrested uh, four men with pending charges and prior violent crime convictions, including one arrest at the Falfurius uh, checkpoint. Uh, other arrests made McAllen, including that of a Salvadorian man linked to a notoriously violent gang. The guy's uh, previous, uh, served uh, 10 years in previous, uh, 10 years in prison for rape. Um, that's what I was uh, getting at. Are we... Are you seeing more of these? Not, not unless we, we have two officers that serve on the violent um, Gulf Coast Task Force here locally with the marshals. So yeah. they're, they're sometimes uh, involved in picking up folks like that. But I don't think a lot of people realize it. But we have a HIDA uh, team here, on a task force, and it's a high-intensity drug trafficking task force through the federal government, DEA. But we serve the Felfurious and Sarita checkpoints. So we have officers here actually will go down there and they process those cases when Border Patrol stops them. We're part of that. So, what do you have? What do you? What do your guys have to do? They go down there and they actually work the case. Border Patrol will seize whatever they seize and just hold it for us. We take the evidence. We transport the prisoners back. We get a magistrate in federal court. We actually uh, testify in the cases. 
So they have a mix of uh, local law enforcement and DEA people that work together on the task force. But at any given time, we usually have at least three or four officers that are they're on a rotation schedule to drive down to the checkpoints uh, 24-7. So when they catch somebody, we go down there, and we're the ones that actually clean the fish. Border Patrol catches them. So that's at uh, Sarita and? Felferius, both. Really? And then we share in proceeds if the, their seizures. Yeah, I knew you. Season, the, the DEA shares with us on on a, on a percentage basis. Is there somebody down there all the time? I, I never, I mean, uh, as many times as I've been through there, I've never seen anybody in a Corpus Christi uniform. You probably won't because they wear a special garb. They, oh, don't, they, do? they, they don't wear our uniforms when they go down. They're going to be dressed in a, more of a plain clothes. But when they go down there, they get called down there. They don't sit down there. So it's only when they actually make an arrest down there. They hold them for us. They put them in a holding cell. And then, you know, it takes an hour and something just to get to Falfurious. We drive down there, and we go down there, you know, bring them back, get a magistrate in federal court, bring back the drugs, and uh, process them and see it all the way through to, uh, to federal court. All right. <clears throat> if you have a uh, question or comment for Assistant Chief Shower, the number is 560-5589, 560-KKTX. I left here Friday, and... I got on West Point Road, and there were two uh, vehicles, one right behind the other, that had uh, pulled over uh, people. Mm. And then I got up on the uh, expressway, and there was one ahead of me. There was another one ahead of me. There were four of them on the freeway, plus the two on West Point Road. There was six. Six patrol cars? Six. And they all had somebody ready to receive their citation. Mm. Yeah. But we, Chief Simpson kicked off the aggressive driving some time back, and uh, we've been writing a lot of citations. Well, on this part of, uh, what is this uh, out here called, Mark? North Padre North Island Padre Drive? Drive, yeah. It was... It was incredible. I've never seen that many uh, people pulled over. You know, when that same, a car passed me uh, last week, maybe the fastest I'd ever seen a car driving down North Padre Island Drive. I mean, I was doing 65. He had to be doing 90-something. Yeah, this is the Autobahn, is you know. Yeah, right. My point is they're doing it because it's a speedway, and it's not supposed to be a speedway. Yeah. Unless it's you and me, then that's different. No, I'm, I'm not doing that. It's a... I, I just don't understand what people get mad at the cops for. Right? The cops aren't in your car. They're not making right. you speed. I don't know why you pull foot. me over because you're doing 90. It's your impatience. Right. It's your, I'm in a hurry. Oh, that's somebody else's fault. I, I quit rationalizing like that a long time ago. Let it be, let it be. Mm-hmm. Oh, no, that was the Gator song. News Radio 1360 KKTX. My thanks to uh, Mark Scott for joining us this morning. And Assistant Chief Mark Showers in the box. You were on a committee five, maybe six years ago about the homeless. Yes. I remember uh, a couple of those meetings. And uh, what do you, what do you think has changed in the discussions we're going to have now is there are there another couple of hooks we can hang people uh from um yeah to, out of sight out of mind well uh, i think one of the things that changes uh, city participation and the city's interest in it um susan thorpe's a major player in that she has a special interest and she made her one of her projects so even though we've been working on it as a city uh, different people throughout the city have roles in the homeless issue and police mm-hmm. departments right up there because of the obvious reasons. But I think uh, being that Susan Thorpe has a special interest, she has a position close to the city manager, I think some things could potentially happen that, that would um, improve the homeless you know, conditions we have now, which is somewhat deplorable if you drive around the city hall area or downtown area certain times of the day. And how I, I'm, I'm not quite clear on this. Uh, I understand, I guess, the argument that I'm supposed to be uh, charitable and help another human being. But I'm not, 
quite clear on why you should improve something for someone who doesn't care. I I, I just uh, it just kind of uh, it escapes me. I think one of the things you need to look at that the homelessness is not caused by one single dimension. So you have some folks out there that are terminally homeless. Well, you'll never change their lifestyle, and those are the ones you're not going to impact. Those folks that want to be there. But there are some people, um, whether it's domestic violence, some temporary drug use, some emotional condition where they're, they're not getting the medicine they're supposed to be on. There's a substantial portion of people that probably could be helped if you were to help them. The thing is you don't want to make a condition uh, that's so inviting that we actually invite people from other areas to move down here because there's things so good to be had. So we, we want to take care of the ones that are here and treat them respectfully, you know, and try to get the ones that we can impact but uh, it's also a matter, I think, of looking at all the different nonprofits that, we, that exist now and trying to make the best of those. And that's where that Homeless Issues Partnership, they're supposed to be sharing and talking about, you know, what each one's doing so they're not overlapping in services and each one contributing. Well, I I have seen uh, people who look like they're homeless and... I I haven't seen anybody treat them with uh, disrespect, especially the Corpus Christi Police Department. <clears throat> I've been present for a couple of uh, those rousts. Hey, you can't sleep here. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that's not, you know, there's no name calling. There's no mm-hmm. finger pointing. They're yeah. just, hey, you can be arrested for trespassing. And if you come back here and I find you here again, I'm going to take you to jail for trespassing. Now, there's usually some expletives uh, hurled around, but it's never the uh, police officer. It's always, hmm. you know, you. Uh, I was not bothering anybody. Why don't you go catch a real criminal? The, you know, same thing that the speeders use. Yeah, but there's there's a substantial number of folks that are actually living off the street, especially in that area, downtown, uptown, mm-hmm. that uh, they get victimized. They get beat up by other homeless folks or sometimes... We had a guy some years ago get set fire to by some hoodlums mm-hmm. on a bus bench. So we have acts of random violence like that. But you'll see them get victimized and victimize each other. And then there's also the, the the huge question of the quality of life issues like trash being left all over. Like the city hall feedings I think you guys talked about last. Uh, yeah, that was ago. abominable. You yeah. got a, a church group going out yeah. and they just leave all their garbage behind. I it, thought that was I, – I, I thought, wait, you're, you're – Trying to solve one problem by creating another one? Yeah. Well, I serve on the board now of the Metro Ministries. So one of the things they did, they opened up their kitchen on weekends. If any of the nonprofits want to use it, that way um, they're using a very clean, certified kitchen. You know, the the, the food should be at a constant right. value. And then you're not leaving all that trash behind uh, like they tend to do on the weekends. All right. I, uh, I watched a... What I thought was a pretty good idea that uh, insurance companies would cover uh, putting people in treatment centers. And I watched as the cost in the treatment center skyrocketed and uh, insurance companies become more hesitant to foot the bill. And I also saw the proliferation of less than reputable places hang out a sign calling themselves a treatment center where you don't do any introspection. You don't do any cleaning up of your own character. You sort of get help blaming it on someone else. And it just seems to me that we're headed in that uh, direction again, because I don't see any, a lot of people with very good intentions get taken advantage of repeatedly. I I guess that shouldn't be my concern if I don't have too much concern for someone I think that has chosen a lifestyle that's detrimental to their health. I, I, I liken it to this. On television, you will, or radio, you hear a commercial for whatever drug it is. 
They tell you to ask your doctor. And then they list all these side effects. Could cause internal bleeding, could cause memory loss, could cause you to lose your sight, lose your hearing, could cause you to rip off your clothes, run naked down the street while setting your hair on fire. Now, they do that because of litigation. However, these same people will go to a vacant parking lot at 2, 3 o'clock in the morning trying to score drugs, and the dealer doesn't have to give that you know, this is uh, not good for your system. It's going to cause you to hallucinate. It's going to make you paranoid. It's pretty much guaranteed to make you rip off your clothes, run down the street without them while setting your hair on fire. So these are choices. And there are, I, I think the women's shelter of uh, South Texas has a really good uh, 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 saving yeah. rate. Well, you know, and then, of course, most of theirs are going to be domestic assaults well, for the women's shelter, you were bring, a substantial you brought, number. Yeah, you were bringing that up. Uh, the, yeah. A lot of it is, uh, I want women and children taken care of. But, I, you know, somebody that makes that choice to, and I know that there is homeless on homeless crime, but there's citizen on citizen crime. Yeah, one thing to underscore, too, the, the point I think you're making is, uh, like at Metro Ministries, I can speak on behalf of them because I'm, I'm sitting on their board now and I listen to them all the time. But the, the thing is to make people self-sustainable, not just to give handouts. So when you have the, the groups coming to City Hall parking lot or anywhere else and just giving handouts, so that's all you're doing is giving out handouts. It's a you, bad idea. Yeah, so you're not really getting that person into your computer system. You're not really giving them all the different uh, nonprofits that are available to help you get back on, on path. So if you're not doing that, then all you're doing is giving a handout and you're really not affecting their condition. Well, how do you go about helping someone achieve some life skills? I think I think once again it depends on where they're coming from that made them homeless because there's there's a lot of temporarily homeless folks. Uh, the ones that you can waste a lot of time on literally are the ones that just choose to be that way and don't want any help, and that they're they're always taking advantage of the system but never contributing back to it. So that leaves also a you know, pretty high percentage of folks out there that you probably could do something with. So you think that is the lesser part of the equation? Yeah, but th- those are the ones you might see the most because those are the ones that chronically, um, they're chronically alcoholic. They're always out there drunk. Those are the ones you'll see the most because those are the ones you'll see the officers stopping on the side of the, the, the street. Uh, the, the, most of the homeless, you're not going to see officers or anybody else. You'll see them walking back and forth, but you're not going to see them in your counter police or, or act irrationally on the side of the, of the road. Something will bring attention to them. Like what? Standing there with a sign that, please help, God bless you? Well, yeah, it could be that, or it could be just standing there screaming. We, we had a, a lady just across from the police department um, a couple of days ago, standing by the park bench and just screaming her lungs out. And um, she obviously has emotional conditions, but it wasn't something we could commit her on, because you can stand there and scream. Well, if it's the same lady I'm thinking about, she panhandles downtown. No, this and is a different she one. This, li- this she's is a different pretty one. loud. This is a different one. I do believe. I, I've never seen this one panhandled, but she she's a good screamer. No, oh, she is. And then there's uh, the uh, young people. And you wonder, come on, really? Yeah. What, what, what will break your heart, though, if you go look at the line of people getting into the, the services to eat, and you see little kids in there. So, you know, whether or not those folks can afford anything, you know, dragging little Having to drag little kids away from their home to actually get a meal somewhere, that's sad. It's Lago in the morning. News Radio 1360 KKTX. Is uh, one of the uh, one of the inner, uh, I don't know if it's a department, family services, is that uh, a police department function? It is for domestic assaults. We have our victim advocates. So if you've been a victim of, um, whether you're male or female, we have a number of uh, civilian counselors that will visit with families and try to get them back on the road and work them through the system. And also they can also apply for victims' benefits through the state. And is that not available to – it's domestic violence, is it not? It is through the police department, yes. 
Yeah. So if you're looking at someone who is uh, taking their children out to eat at uh, Loaves and Fishes, mm-hmm. you can put them on the uh, right road or you can get them into that program? Not not by the police department. It would have to be some kind of a crime involved for us to get involved with it. Uh, the social agencies are the ones that would help with that. In fact, we have something a lot of people don't know about down here. It's called 211. Mm-hmm. You just dial 211. It's like a 911 for social services. So it's paid for. It's, uh, it's out of United Way, out of Houston. We have a local rep here. But if you have some need, like you think your family is in need of something or you're having a hard time working through some, whether it's benefits, some, some it could even be a substance abuse program you're looking for, they're supposed to be able to look and get, get you the nearest help. So you dial 211, tell them what you need, and they're supposed to be able to dispatch or get you hooked up with somebody that might be able to help you. And what do you think, that that uh, has just not been talked about enough? I think a lot of people still don't know uh, what it is, you know, 211, and yep. it might just take a while for more people to become um, used to it, but it's, it's out there. It's been out there for a number of years now. Well, who answers that phone? Is that here local, or is that a it, United Way 800 It goes, center? I think it's entered 24-7, so it goes to an answering service, and they, they'll listen to what you have to say, and then they try to hook you up with the nearest social agency that could help you. So how do we get the word out about Two one one. Uh, Janet Chu is a local representative. She makes uh, different kinds of meetings, and I think it's uh, if you just type in two one one on the the internet for Texas Texas two one one. Yep, it'll pop up, and you can read about it. But I, I think they just need to keep advertising it, reinforcing it. I know all the local shelters know about it, but it's just a matter of getting the word out because there's a lot of folks that don't use the shelters that might be able to use one of their services. Why wouldn't they use a shelter? Is it well, some of the people standing in line um, mm-hmm. just probably can't afford to eat. They, they don't necessarily have to be homeless. Like a Metro Ministries, I think you get three visits before you have to log into the system to actually identify yourself. And then uh, they actually give you an ID that you can, you can come revisit. But the whole idea is to get you in the system. And, of course, uh, the state of Texas changed their policy not too long ago in the last couple of months where if you want to start using local agencies for um, you know assistance, you have to have a point of entry for those, and we have three locally. Metro Ministries is one of them. So basically, when you come into the system, any other nonprofit locally is supposed to refer them to one of those three, and one of those three is supposed to enter in the system so you're not duplicating services. Like the same person is hitting all the different nonprofits and getting the same service when, you know, and using it up where other people can't get to them. All right. Um, we had talked about uh, animal uh, services, and – do, does the city have the, its own adoption for, or do you refer people to the uh, Humane Society or Pee Wees or Pals Animal Shelter? No, we, we we don't do that, but we do have both. Uh, we use the PAC, People Assisting Animal Control. Um, we had a partnership with them for many years, and now they're building a separate facility over there off of Ayers, close mm-hmm. to Holly. But we do both. We have our own uh, in-house adoptions where people can adopt out. And then when PAC was there, they were actually facilitating it. It was actually city animals that were facil- facilitating unless they just plain bought them. But then we also uh, have a relationship with the cattery, where the cattery will sometimes come and they'll just walk our cages and uh, pick you know kittens or cats they think they can adopt out, and they'll just take them out before they're treated so we have no cost in that. And then they spay-neuter them or give them their shots, and then they, they uh, adopt them out. So we have both. We we have in house and and uh, not profits we use. All right, Mark. It's good to see. You. I I appreciate you uh, coming in this morning. Thanks. Thank you. Did we uh, cover the uh, things you needed to cover? Um, well, I think the homeless uh, issues is going to be very important. I think it's going to not go away. Obviously, so I think we're going to make some progress. All right, my thanks to uh, City Councilman Mark Scott. Tomorrow, Councilman uh, Chad McGill and uh, Dr. Keith Rose. Uh, Have yourself a Bluebell Country Day.